New York Times reporter David Gellis claims in his latest book that legendary General Electric CEO Jack Welsh is the root of all that's wrong with capitalism today. His book is titled The Man Who Broke Capitalism, and it's subtitled How Jack Welsh Gutted the Heartland and Crushed the Soul of Corporate America and How to Undo His Legacy. New York Times reporter Gellis says while Welsh made GE the most valuable company on earth, his strategies ultimately destroyed what he loved so dearly. David Gellis, when did you get interested in Jack Welsh? You know, I've been a business reporter for 10 years, and so I've been hearing about Jack for a long time. But it was really only in the last few years that it began began to be began to become clear to me just how influential he still was today, despite having retired some 20 years ago. And I can tell you sort of the exact moments that crystallized this idea. But suffice it to say, this man has loomed large over the business world for a long time now. And as my reporting demonstrated, he is still shaping the way our companies operate, the way our CEOs operate in profound ways to this day. What do you think of him? Well, that's a big question, and I wrote a big book about it. On balance, though, as I looked at the ledger and really tried to assess the legacy, the impact he had had, not only on GE, not only on GE stock while he was running the company, but more broadly on the way other companies operate and CEOs operate, as I said, on the economy at large, because he was so influential in ways that we can talk about, I came to the conclusion that Jack Welch had a singularly destructive effect on our shared prosperity in this nation, and that because of actions he took, because of precedents he took, people are still suffering today. I made a list over the years, uh, as you know more than I do. He was uh, head of GE back in the early 1980s, and I just want to run down this it's about four numbers, five numbers. 1982, the GE stock was $6. 1991, GE stock was 19 In 2000, near the time he retired, it was 400 and, five, five, 458 And then in 2003, just a short time after that, it was $181. And I'm not, I'm not, I know there's been some splits in there, so uh, that can be confusing. But today it's, the, the day we're in, uh, doing this, it's 62. What does all that tell you? Does that mean anything? Sure. Listen, Jack Welch turned GE into the most valuable company in the world when he was CEO. And he gets to claim credit for that for all eternity. What I dive into in the book is the ways in which he did it and the consequences of those actions. And as I demonstrate, he created that absolute fountain of shareholder value with deal making, with downsizing, and with financialization. You know, GE was an industrial company when he took over. By the time he left, it was essentially an unregulated bank. And the story of what happened in those intervening 20 years, while the stock was going up, yes, tells you a whole lot about our priorities as a society, tells you a whole lot about which way the wind was blowing in the economy, and really gives a stark picture of how people in this company have been employed and fired, right? In the first years after he took over, he unleashed this wave of mass layoffs and factory closures that destabilized the American middle class. And because GE was so influential, and because other companies and CEOs look to GE for guidance on how they ought to comport themselves, look to GE and Jack Welch for an example of how they ought to behave, everyone else started doing the same thing. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But it was one of these moments 
where something shifted in this economy. No longer was this the quote-unquote golden age of capitalism. These decades after World War II that gave rise to the greatest generation and that allowed for the flourishing of this tremendous middle class. No, when Jack Welch arrived as CEO of GE in 1981, he ushered in this new cutthroat era of capitalism that is still with us today. Here's a brief piece of audio of him talking to an audience back in 2003 and listen to this and then give me the follow-up on it. You can't say that you believe in integrity and then have somebody do something bad and let him sneak out the door because the lawyers say you can't really say. You're going to hang him in the square. You've got to let people know when they do something wrong. They didn't leave for personal reasons. They left because they didn't have the values. What, what are you hearing there? Yeah, well, the first thing that jumps out at me is just his, his use of this violent rhetoric. You know, it's something that I don't think any CEO could get away with today, given the world we're all living in. But it's important to note that from the 80s right until and through retirement, he employed these sort of murderous metaphors when he talked about downsizing and firing people. In fact, when his chosen successor, Jeff Immel, missed earnings during the financial crisis, Jack Welch went on CNBC and said, if he did it again, he should be shot. And it's an indication of just how aggressive, how ruthless, how cutthroat this man's temperament was. And again, it's impossible to overstate just how influential GE was during the entirety of the 20th century. And so when other CEOs saw Jack Welch, the greatest CEO of all time, behaving like that, that gave them tacit permission to do the same sort of thing. And so I draw a direct line from that kind of behavior, that kind of rhetoric, to men like Travis Kalanick, the you know CEO of Uber, who so famously flamed out after this rash of sort of bad temperament and aggressive management style. And again, this is just yet another example of the way in which what Jack did, because no CEO was talking to their employees like that in the 1970s and the 1960s, they would have been fired. But somehow Jack was able to get away with it. And he gave permission. He set the precedent so that so many other CEOs are still behaving like this today. He died March 1st, uh, 2020, and General Electric issued in on their uh, website a PR obituary about him. And I just want to ask you, because the numbers had gone down considerably, as you know, from when he was there. The stock was, as I said, it was 458 in 2000. Today it's in the 60s. But Larry Culp, who is the current CEO, said this about Jack Welsh back at his death time. Jack was larger than life and the heart of GE for half a century, Culp said. He reshaped the face of our country and the business world. Culp also shared his last memory of Welsh. He asked me, so how exactly are you running the company? Jack was still in it, committed to GE's success. Uh, he goes on to call him a legend. And I just wonder why they felt so strongly about it at that point. Oh, I, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't hear anything in there that I necessarily disagreed with. Uh, Culp didn't call him the greatest manager of all time. He didn't say GE was better off <laughs> before Welch's tenure. He said that he was the heart and soul of the company for 50 years, which I think is absolutely true. And he said that he affected the company and the business world and the broader economy, all of which I agree with. So uh, it's, it's interesting hearing that, which I've, of course, read, uh, read fresh to me now. It, 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 nothing, nothing. I, I, I have no notes, no comments. Well, but the same twist what, on... What are you getting at? Go ahead. I'm just going to say the same small twist on that later on in the statement. Uh, Culp said, we will continue to honor his legacy by doing exactly what Jack would want us to do win. Ah, well, there's the real tell. There's the real tell. And to your first question about why the company felt the need to honor Welch, especially when the track record of GE in the years after he retired is less than satisfactory, I think it speaks to this need from CEOs, from corporations, 
to really defend their legacy. And listen, GE was all in on Welch. And he is, like it or not, at this point, synonymous with the company and will be for, you know, all of time, as long as people are talking about GE. And so there is vested interest in them propagating his legacy and continuing to hold him up as this exemplar CEO, regardless of the true consequences of that. Start with where he came from originally. Yeah, Jack grew up, you know, relatively poor in the suburbs of Boston. Um, He came from an Irish Catholic family. He was an only child. His mother was very involved in his upbringing. His father was a unionized worker on the local railroad who didn't seem to play quite as large a role in his life as his mother certainly did. He was short. He had a stutter. Uh, And he grew up because of those things with sort of, you know, he once described himself on the outside looking in with his nose pressed up against the glass. And it was this sense, you know, early on that he was very competitive, that he was going to be uh, keenly interested in trying to get ahead. And lucky for him, he was incredibly bright, incredibly smart. There's no denying his work ethic and his absolute mental sharps. You know, to the from, from from early on when he was, I think, the youngest person at the time to graduate with a doctorate from the University of Champaign, Illinois, to his late tenure at GE as CEO, when people were terrified to have meetings with him because he usually knew more about their own businesses than they did. Uh, he was possessed with a real ferocious intelligence. So uh, it's important to note all those things. But he came to the job shortly after. He graduated, and GE was the only company he ever worked for. He joined GE, and from the outset was absolutely ambitious, deeply competitive, and very quickly became focused on not just working his way up the ranks, but by the early 70s had stated his intention to become CEO of this company one day. And everything he did during those decades was designed towards giving him the perch as the most powerful CEO in corporate America, and it's something he achieved. How would you say that he worked through the ranks at GE, and how soon did did they recognize that he had the talent to eventually become uh, CEO? Yeah, they recognized it early on. He was um, he was he he got himself noticed initially not through a feat of you know great business prowess, but because he this, he threatened to quit the company because he found out that the people sitting next to him had gotten the same kind of raise, the same one thousand dollar I think it was raise that he did, and he thought he deserved more, even though he hadn't necessarily done a whole lot. He thought he was working harder, so he deserved more money. But it was not too long after that that he did begin to have some real business successes. He worked initially in the plastics division, and he was able to develop some new products, not without hiccups. He famously blew up a factory early in his tenure. Uh, and w- when he was pushing his team to sort of go faster, move harder, use more volatile products and formulas to try to get this product to market as quickly as possible, a whole factory b- blew up. And, and it's a miracle no one was hurt severely or killed, for that matter. He was summoned to headquarters the next day and with his tail between his legs. And But I think this is a crucial moment because he really faced no consequences. He got this early taste of impunity where he believed from that moment on that he could almost get away with anything. And that, I think, helps explain how it is that from that moment on, he went barreling through his career really, you know, without much regard to the consequences of his actions. Without, you know, he blew up a factory once, but he closed many more factories than that. He fired hundreds of thousands of people. And in the same way that he never faced consequences for that initial explosion, he never really faced the consequences for that kind of ruthless management practice. He retired, as you know, in 2001. He died at age 84 in 2020. And the personal side of him included three marriages. Um, Some of this was very public during the time that he was retired. There was Carolyn uh, Osborne, 59 to 87, Jane Beasley, 89 to 2003, and then Susie Wetlaufer, 2004 to 2020. What does that side of Jack Welsh tell us? (laughs) 
there's a whole lot I could have written about Jack Welch's personal life, and I chose to mostly leave that on the cutting room floor. Uh, we can talk about the most pertinent bits, but I really didn't think about this book as a traditional biography that was trying to be a comprehensive recounting of one man's life. I really tried to use it as an evidence-based polemic about Welch's influence on the economy and really make this a book at the end of the day that was about not just a man, but about the system that we all live in and work in. So I, I'm happy to answer the question. We can talk about Jack's personal life, but I just want to emphasize that while, yes, there were some colorful episodes, and yes, there's a whole lot of stuff that people have said about Jack's personal life over the years uh, that I did not put in the book, this, at the end of the day, is a book to me about the people who worked at G rather than the people Jack chose to spend his personal time with. Reason- so if you want to talk about the details of his divorce, for example, which I think is probably the most pertinent part of his personal life as it relates to the broader business narrative because of his uh, retirement package and everything that came after that. Happy to do so. Um, But just want to sort of put in context that I didn't dive deep into the details of his early marriages, for example. The reason I brought it up is because uh, in the years, you know, since he was there, CEOs across the country have gotten themselves in trouble with these extramarital affairs and their relationship to power. And that's why I wanted to insert that and get your opinion of that, because as you point out over the years, these uh, these people become in the eyes of people that are in the business world as heroes. That's the very thesis of this book. You know, when I started, when I sat down to actually write it, I realized, as I said, this is a book about man. Yes, yes, this is a book about a company. Yes, yes, this is a book about the economy. Absolutely. Ultimately, this is a book about how we as a society choose to understand and look up to and often revere our CEOs and what that says about us. I'm trying to turn the mirror back on us. And what does it say about our collective priorities? that our CEOs are some of the people we care most about, the people we think about the most, the people who we elevate and put on the cover of our magazine. We can have that conversation. On uh, on, On the retirement and on his divorce, I think I do want to make a point here, which is that it was through the process of his divorce, shortly after retirement, that the details of his retirement package came out. And they were extraordinary. It was a $417 million exit package. Jack Welch was a people manager his whole career, and yet had almost become a billionaire for it, making the list of the Forbes 400 richest Americans. And the details didn't just stop at how much stock and cash he got when he left the building. GE, in his retirement, was picking up the tab for his penthouse apartment overlooking Central Park, for his meals at the fanciest restaurants in New York City, for his tickets to the Knicks and the Metropolitan Opera, for the flowers in his houses and his Internet and cables bill. They were paying for everything about his life. And that was a first glimmer of the degree to which CEOs have managed to, I'm sorry, to con their boards and to con investors and shareholders into footing the bill for their lavish lifestyles. That continues to this day. And when you look at the inexorable rise of executive compensation over the last 30 or so years, you can trace it back directly to some of the enormous stock awards that Jack Welch was the first to receive in the 1980s and understand why it is that CEOs now make an average of something like 350 or 400 times as much as the median employee in their organization, why it is that CEO pay continues to go up by 16 or 30% every year on average, crazy numbers, even as real wages for many Americans fall, and why it is that CEOs are worth tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, the minimum wage in this country, the federal minimum wage is stuck at $7.25 an hour. Those are the ways in which I think the Jack Welch story helps us explain this upside down world we live in today. I'll come back to Jack Welch, but I want to ask you about uh, David Gellis uh, and your background. How long did you write the corner office column in the New York Times and how many CEOs did you talk to? (laughs) 
I wrote the corner office column for about five years at the New York Times. And during that time, I interviewed more than 100 CEOs, uh, well over. I sort of don't have an exact count. But that was just the corner office column. And in my day job, I was covering CEOs as well. So over the past five, six, seven years covering business at the New York Times, I've spoken with hundreds and hundreds of CEOs. And again, this is part of how I wrote this book. Jack Welch's name kept coming up. It was bizarre. You know, how was it that this CEO who had retired some 20 years ago was still living rent free in the minds of today's CEOs? That was just a question that bugged me. Any other traits uh, among those CEOs that you took away, three or four things that uh, you hear all the time from them? I think what it means to be a CEO today has changed in pretty profound ways. And it's easy to look at all that and think that the era of Jack Welch is over. But what I've concluded is that a lot of these changes are relatively superficial. So today you'll hear CEOs talk a lot about emotional intelligence and trying to connect with their employees. But if you actually look at how they treat their employees, it hasn't gotten a whole lot better. And this is, this is a tension, I think, at the heart of capitalism today, and one that I explore in the book, which is how is it that we can allow all of our companies to sort of proclaim their commitment to stakeholder capitalism, to ESG goals, or to CSR, or pick your acronym, about you know however companies are describing their uh, new lofty purposes, and yet you look at the actual numbers, and just in the last week we've seen mass layoffs again because the stock market's down, and it's very hard to give you know to, to let these people say all that with a straight face when at the slightest sign of a down stock market, at the slightest sign of any economic uncertainty, they're firing people by the thousands. I um, heard you say, and I watched a couple of videos where you were speaking, and I heard you say at one point, I am not a socialist. And I wanted to ask you why you thought you had to say that. Well, I don't, I don't remember the setup. So I don't know if someone accused me of being a socialist that I had to defend myself. But I, I think a lot of people, especially a lot of people in the business world, people who went to business school, other CEOs, people who worked at GE, might hear me and think like, oh, he's just another, you know, pick your pick your nasty word to describe me and suggest that I somehow don't believe in making money or that I think companies shouldn't make a profit. And none of that could be farther from the truth. Uh, I've been a business reporter for 10 years. I believe in capitalism. I think uh, as an economic system, it is flawed. But at the end of the day, it has done more than any other economic system to alleviate global poverty and create uh, higher standards of living for people. My point, though, in this book and in, in the conversations I'm having, is that things have gotten out of whack. And capitalism works when there are guardrails. Capitalism works when it works for everyone. And I'm not sitting here saying that everyone should make the same amount of money, but I'm saying that things have gotten completely out of balance. And when we look across our country and try to understand why it is that our schools are failing, why it is our inner cities are so rough, why it is there's no more jobs in so many cities and towns around the country, a lot of the answers to those questions start with how our largest corporations treat our people. And in aggregate, those decisions that men like Jack Welch make to fire people, to send them off to lower wage jobs, to close factories, all in the name of making profits for Wall Street investors, you know, over 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years, those decisions catch up with us. And you need only walk the streets of so many places in this country today to see exactly what that looks like. I believe you've worked for the New York Times since 2013. It is a stock company. Uh, how has the New York Times treated you as an employee? I'm very fortunate to work for the New York Times company. Um, it's a unique company. Uh, you, you correctly note that it is publicly traded, but the majority of its voting shares uh, continue to be held by the Soulsberger family, which uh, for decades now has demonstrated an absolutely unwavering commitment to the funding and preserving 
our ability as a newsroom to do independent fact-based journalism. And so for all that, I'm tremendously grateful. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, people don't go into journalism to, to make money. If I wanted to maximize my profits, I would have gone and been an investment banker or worked in tech or something. But I chose this profession because I, I love the work and I believe it can make an impact. Uh, and and I'm, I'm deeply fortunate and I recognize it to, to be at a company that uh, cares about continuing a tradition of you know, promoting really high quality journalism. And our newsroom is bigger than ever. And the company is doing really well. Where did you grow up? I was born in New York City. I then lived in Seattle until I was about 10. Then I was in the San Francisco Bay Area until I went to college. I bounced around a lot after that. Boston, Albuquerque, Washington, D.C., Miami, back to Berkeley, <laughs> back to New York. So I've moved quite a bit. And where did you start writing? At what publication? Uh, my, my first forays into journalism are not ones that I'm going to put on, on my highlight reel, I'll be honest with you. It took me a while to, to find my way into this profession. You know, many of my colleagues at the New York Times were, you know, on their high school student newspaper and the editors of their college newspapers. I didn't do any of that. I was off, you know, sort of wandering around the world uh, looking at the stars and looking at the mountains for a few years there. But by my early 20s, I realized that I really cared about this work in a deep and, and meaningful way. And so when I was in Washington, D.C., I was, I was not working as a journalist. I was designing museum exhibitions, as a matter of fact. I started just doing freelance journalism on the side, and I just got hooked. Uh, I got hooked, and I found myself writing during my lunch break and going and trying to report stories after I got off my work at the design firm. And that, to me, was an indication I probably ought to do something about this and go uh, see if I can make a career out of this. And I was very fortunate to be able to do so. I watched your TEDx in the Berkshires uh, when you discussed your time in India. Why did you go to India, and what did you find there? What did you study there? Hmm. Uh, when I was in college, I spent my junior year in India. And for the first half of that year, I lived in Bodh Gaya, which is the place in northern India where the Buddha is said to have achieved enlightenment and remains the largest Buddhist pilgrimage center in India. And I went there to study Buddhism, no surprise. And I had, a couple years before, began practicing on my own in the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was very curious and excited to sort of explore that tradition in a more fulsome way. And spent uh, about a half year studying somewhat formally in India, in monasteries, going on long, silent meditation retreats, and learning about and studying different traditions of Buddhist uh, uh, thought and also meditation practices. And then when that semester was over, I, I stayed in India and continued to travel and meditate for, for some time. And, and I, I continue to have an on and off meditation practice to this day. What was your book, Mindful Work? That was the first book I wrote. It seems like a long time ago. It probably was seven or eight years. And I, again, had this grounding in Buddhist practice. And so I was so surprised when, as a reporter for the Financial Times, where I was working at the time, I started to hear about companies it, making space and encouraging their employees to meditate in the office. And these were just my two worlds colliding as a business reporter who had also been a Buddhist. I, I figured I was sort of uniquely qualified to cover this. So I wrote a big magazine story about it for the New York Times, uh, excuse me, for the Financial Times. And that became my first book, Mindful Work, How Meditation is Changing Business from the Inside Out. And I explored the whole range of different companies that were finding different ways to use meditation. I explored how CEOs were trying to find a way to use meditation and mindfulness to increase their own performance and productivity. And, and I also took a hard look at some of the commercialization and, uh, you know, the, 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 the spiritual materialism, as we sometimes call it, that was starting to almost inevitably uh, infiltrate and, and shape this world as well. How much evidence did you ever see that Jack Welsh meditated? <laughs> I never heard that. But I, I think I will note, and I mentioned in the book, that in retirement, he undertook this grand campaign to essentially rewrite his own history and reshape how people thought about him. And one of the ways he did that was by doing, I think it was an audio book or a lecture series 
about you know what it means to be a great leader. And a big part of that was emotional intelligence. And I think if you asked anyone who worked closely with Welch over the years, that's not exactly how they would describe him. When you were working for the Financial Times for five years, you went to prison, and not you didn't, but you went to interview Bernie, <laughs> Bernie Madoff. Uh, what was that about, and what did you learn about Bernie Madoff? Uh, well, I'm fortunate I didn't go to prison, but I did indeed um, take a reporting trip down to Butner, South, uh, North Carolina, where I was very fortunate to be one of the few reporters ever to go inside uh, F.C. Butner, as they called it, uh, medium security federal correctional facility in the woods of North Carolina and sit down with Bernie Madoff, the man who orchestrated the world's largest ever Ponzi scheme, you know, wiping out some $60 billion in wealth and upending the lives of thousands and thousands of people. Uh, that was a story that I had pursued for years. Um, shortly after Madoff was arrested, I discovered that a source of mine had a connection to him, and I asked the, you know, this sort of uh, source and a succession of other sources to start helping me communicate with him in prison. And it took some time, but ultimately I was able to strike up a line of uh, dialogue. And after several months of exchanging letters and negotiating with the prison, I was granted an audience. And so with very little notice, I rushed down to North Carolina and got to spend two hours sitting across the table from him. And the thing that really surprised me, I don't know if it should have surprised me, but, but one of the most vivid takeaways that I still think about this to this day was his real lack of remorse. Uh, he didn't seem to have a lick of sympathy or empathy or even regret for what he had done. And as an, I'm not a psychologist, but as I've read, this is the mark of a, what I think is clinically described as a sociopath, sort of the inability to understand the suffering of other people. And that was my big takeaway from spending time with Bernie Madoff. And listen, just to bring it back to my book, The Man Who Broke Capitalism, about Jack Welch, Jack Welch was not a Ponzi schemer. But I do believe there was some of that same dissociation, some of that same willingness to dehumanize the people whose lives he was affecting with these mass layoffs in the same way that I think Bernie Madoff ultimately had to not consider the the true consequences of his actions for all those people whose money he stole. What impact do you think, it's not just Harvard, but the Harvard MBA and other MBAs have had over the years during the Jack Welsh years, because you mentioned a lot of people that he uh, mentored and that uh, you look them up and they got a Harvard MBA. What's, what's the, what's the point there? Anything, anything you want to say about that? Uh, I have not done the full deep dive into the legacy of the MBA. I got to be honest with you. I've been thinking about it um, because this is not the first time I've had this conversation in the last uh, couple weeks. But what I would say is that even 10 years before Jack Welch came to power, the economist Milton Friedman started talking about the role of business in society and that the the purpose of corporations was simply to maximize their profits. It took 10 years between when Milton Friedman famously wrote that in the New York Times Magazine uh, and Jack Welch finally taking over GE before someone, in my estimation, really put it into action, really uh, took those words, took that sentiment and made it real. Uh, But beyond Milton Friedman and beyond what Jack Welch did, which I do contend was the most influential manifestation of shareholder primacy, that school of thought, this belief that the only thing businesses really ought to be doing at the end of the day is making money for their investors has absolutely permeated our culture and has infected the brains of just about everyone who went to business school. You know, I, just last night, I'm not exaggerating here, I ran into an old friend who I hadn't seen in years, and he said, David, I just read your book. And uh, he said, initially, I just read the book because you're my friend, and I figured I'd pick it up and sort of do you a solid. But he said, it made me rethink just about everything I've learned at business school because he's a CEO, he went to business school, and he said, I'm starting to question all the things I was taught 
And that to me is, you know, whether or not that sticks, whether or not that's real, that's the kind of dialogue, the kind of conversation I hoped this book would start. Because again, I'm not saying that people shouldn't make money or that corporations shouldn't turn a profit, but the degree to which we focus on that to the exclusion of all else and the consequences of how we go about doing that matter. And they matter for individuals, they matter for those individuals' families, they matter for, matter for our communities, and they matter for our country. And so when people start thinking like, wait, what is the real purpose? What should we be doing when we're running a business? If we can start re-exploring some of those topics, I actually do believe we'll be better off for it down the line. You point out that today there are half as many public companies as there were in Welsh's day. And my question to you is um, why and also what's the difference for a group of people running a private company, not stock traded, and the public companies? And which one is the better way to do the best for everybody? Oh, great questions. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why there are so many fewer public companies today than there were uh, several decades ago. Those reasons include the the fact that it's a, a pain in the butt to be a public company. There's a lot of reporting. It includes, I think most pertinently for the argument I make in the book, the fact that there has been this nonstop wave of mergers and acquisitions and corporate consolidation over the last many decades that has simply concentrated power in just about every industry into a very small handful of companies, which has, uh, as many academics have explored now, reduced competition and increased prices for consumers and industry after industry. And it's also the fact that companies are now able to stay private longer because there's a lot more private capital. So that's, you know, the, those are some of the reasons why we have fewer public companies today. But I think the, the more intriguing question you ask is, which is better? Is it better for there to be a public company or a private company? And I don't know that we can really say that one or the other is better for employees or better for uh, investors. Um, both can be very profitable. Both can take good care of its peop- their people. Um, I will say that the pressure that public companies face to report quarterly earnings uh, every 90 days, roughly, creates a huge amount of stress and a huge amount of emphasis on short-term profits. And at the end of the day, you know, this does get back to what Welch was pursuing at GE and the way he went about it. He relentlessly hit those earnings. He meet or beat analyst expectations for almost 80 quarters in a row. And he did that because he knew if he told Wall Street that they were going to make $300 million in profit in the quarter, and they made $300 million in in profit in the quarter, the stock was probably going to go up. And so he did whatever he needed to, whatever was possible to make sure they meet or beat analyst expectations. And sometimes that meant firing people. Sometimes that meant closing factories. But he was able to do it, and he kept the stock going up for just about the entire duration of his career. And again, so there's that incentive Got to meet or beat, but what's the consequence? How do you get there? And what's the actual impact on the people whose lives are being affected? When did GE buy NBC? Oh, I'm going to forget the exact year. I feel like it was around 1987 as part of the RCA acquisition. I may have the date a little wrong, but it was in the mid to late 80s, 85, 86, 87, I believe. And the reason I mention that is because in your book you say that the year after Welsh hired Roger Ailes to launch CNBC, setting in motion events that would lead to the creation of Fox News, Welsh went into business with Trump. What does all that mean? Well, Jack Welch and Donald Trump were uh, friends and business partners for decades uh, in, in the years I think it was in the early to mid-90s, GE Pension Fund, I believe, uh, struck a deal with then Mr. Trump, far from being a president at that point, uh, to redevelop a large golden skyscraper on the edge of Central Park. So that was their first foray into business together. 
And then in retirement, they continued palling around together, attending football games together. Uh, And then when Jack Welch launched his online for-profit MBA program, he appeared on The Apprentice, uh, Donald Trump's show, which ran on NBC, which was still owned by GE at the time, to promote it. And then the two of them, you know, hit Rockefeller Center the next morning and uh, were on Good Morning America together. Uh, And right up until the end, these two were orbiting each other. And in the book, I later talk about some of the conspiracy theories that they were propagating on Twitter and the way they sort of reinforced each other in creating this new disinformation ecosystem, uh, which, of course, has had all sorts of deleterious effects on our society. You say Welsh loved Apprentice, uh, and quote, you quote him saying, I knew it was going to be a, a, a good show when Susie, that was his then wife, and I were watching it in bed with, two, uh, with her two kids, and they started shouting, you're fired, you're fired, Welsh said. It's a home run. I bring that up because you, he had this plan, I and explain it, to fire 10% of his work population every year. Yes, this is what was known as stack ranking. Uh, it was another one of these absolutely sort of shrewd management practices that Welch devised in the 1980s. And the way it works was this. He said, if you're a manager and you have 100 people working for you, you put 20 of them in the top category. That's your A players. You put 70% of them in your B category. And you put the bottom 10% and call them the, your C players, A, B, C. And those C players, that 10%, every single year, you got to fire them. No matter how good the company's doing, no matter if some of them were actually doing really good at their job, your bottom 10% is out the door every single year. And that created a huge amount of internal strife, of competition, of people working at cross purposes and almost at times turning on each other inside GE. But it was another one of these Jack Welch management practices that spread across the economy like a virus. Even to this day, companies like WeWork and Uber in recent years have been using stack ranking. Microsoft did it famously for years and years under Steve Ballmer. And there's, you look at the face of it and it's just madness, right? It's like, why are you automatically firing 10% of people every year just because you can, just because you can do it? Uh, 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 to me, it's just yet another sort of shake your head moment when you look at the legacy of Jack Welch. You took a detour in the book at one point and talked about 3G capital. Can you give us the background on that? I think people would be interested in knowing how much they own of the American uh, product. Uh, 3G capital is a private, um, well, it's, it's, it's a complicated company. It's sort of private, it's sort of public. The upshot is, though, it's a group of Brazilian billionaires who were inspired as much as anyone by Welch and determined to use his management practices to hoover up as much of the industry as they could and have gone on to own and control companies including Anheuser-Busch, which is now known as AB InBev, maker of Bud and just about every other beer you see in the supermarket. They control Kraft Heinz, the uh, major food group, which is a combination, of course, of Kraft and H.J. Heinz. They own or control Tim Hortons and Burger King. And the list goes on. And the reason I mention them in the book is because they, as much as any other group of CEOs, as I mentioned, uh, explicitly have said over the years that they were inspired by Jack Welch. And if you look at their track record, yes, they've created some some shareholder value in the short term. But at the end of the day, their companies fall back to earth. And they are often followed by accusations of earnings mismanagement, of absolutely brutal treatment of their employees, of dubious, dubious financial accounting practices, and of a history of underinvesting in research and development that at the end of the day, after, you know, a pop in the stock because everything's there, it's so lean and they're just optimizing for product profitability, 
inevitably creates a situation where those companies are falling behind in the market because they haven't been investing in R&D, haven't been investing in their people. And it's just yet another example of the way in which this Jack Welch playbook that so many CEOs have followed over the years, that so many different companies, ultimately leaves companies bankrupt. Tell me, uh, why in 2018 was GE removed from one, I think it's 30 companies that are in the Dow? Yeah. yeah the Dow Jones Industrial Average is the, the, the longest, most esteemed bellwether stock index in, in, in the in the country. And GE was among the original 30 companies, and it was the last remaining. But as you say, I think it was 2018, they were removed and they were replaced, I believe, by a pharmacy chain, which to me was just so symbolic. And in doing so, the, the company that operates the Dow said GE essentially no longer matters to the American economy. And what does matter is this pharmacy chain. And it was, I think it was, you know, as more symbolic than anything else. But in a way, it was a sort of a repudiation of the Welch strategy. You know, if everything he had done had worked so well, it would have still been working well 15 years after he had retired. And he even said as much. I quote him in the book saying, you know, my real legacy will be determined by how well the company and my successor fare after I'm gone. And by that measure, you could argue Jack Welch was a failure. But when somebody buys a share of stock or lots of shares of stock, wouldn't it be in the interest of both the company and the shareholder to maximize the profit? Uh, listen, m- maximize, right? Like, what does that mean? When we say maximize, do we say, are we saying do everything you possibly can to make as much money as you can, but in what time frame? Are we talking about maximizing profits in 90-day increments, in 100-day, 80-day increments, in one-year increments, or in five- and 10-year increments? There's no right answer to that question. But what I'm encouraging people to do is understand that maximizing profits comes with consequences. And it's that balancing act between finding what's a reasonable amount of profits to extract from a company and doing so while at the same time investing enough in your people, in your communities, in your R&D, in your CapEx to keep the company and your communities and our society healthy. And we just simply have not been doing that for decades now. You know, almost out of nowhere, CEOs' salaries and compensation jumped to the $35 million a year, or in other cases, there's one now in this country, I think it was like $165 million a year. And these are people, like you say, Jack Welsh, uh, like Jack Welsh, who didn't build anything. They just run something. What tr- Was he triggered the one that triggered all that, or were there others? There was, there was, of course, he was not the only one, but he was among the first. Absolutely. It was in the 1980s that GE's board started awarding him these gargantuan, gargantuan pay packages. And that, again, set the precedent. And it continued until his retirement. I, in the book, trace how in the same way that other companies started parroting his executive compensation, his annual compensation plan, they did the same thing with his retirement package. People looked at the language that was used in the GE separation agreement with him, and they just copied and pasted it into others. And all of a sudden, other CEOs at other companies were entitled to millions and millions of dollars in retirement themselves. And so there's this uh, almost inexorable sort of snowball effect with CEOs that because the guy down the street is getting $10 million a year, well, I need to get 10 and a half. And that cycle has never ended. And uh, there's no sign of it letting up, even as so many people in this country are struggling to get by. The average American, I suspect, does not know that members of these boards can make upwards of three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a year by attending eight meetings a year. Um, how much responsibility do the board members have for creating somebody like Jack Welsh? And is it all interconnected? And you'll never stop this if you think that's what ought to happen. Yeah, I mean, the boards absolutely have a huge amount of responsibility. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of boards 
as you suggest, have their own self-interest at play here, too. Uh, as long as the stock was going up, you know, let's not forget, these board members are awarded a whole lot of company stock. And so there's very little incentive. And this is what I keep coming back to when I'm thinking about the book and, and in my conversation. Like, what are the incentive structures? How are we rewarding people? If we are just rewarding people based on moving the stock needle up, well, then that's what they're going to do. That's what they're going to optimize for and with giving very little concern to other people. So what I would love to see is companies optimizing and incentivizing for other things, other ways to incentivize CEOs and reward them with long-term compensation based on things like the overall financial well-being of their entire employee population. That to me is a more creative way of thinking about how it is we can make sure that CEOs are really working in the best interest of everyone. How did the following happen? You write about this on page 175, and that is that you had one of the best-known companies in the world, AT&T, buy several things that were way overpriced, as you well know. DirecTV, they paid $67 million, billion dollars for. AT&T spent $85 billion to buy Time Warner. Uh, they lost billions and billions of dollars. Does anybody in leadership ever suffer anything from making mistakes like that, including the board of directors? No. And that's one of the big problems with our economy. And it goes back to the impunity I was talking about earlier in the conversation. We have almost no ways to hold CEOs and directors responsible for their failings, for their collective failings. And as a result, again, this is the incentives. There's no, there's no disincentive for screwing up. Well, you, you say on the same page that Randall Stevenson, who was AT&T's empire-building chief executive, went into full neutron jack mode. He sliced 20,000 workers a year while drawing $30 million in salary. He's no longer CEO, but he took his $30 million with him, and that company is not the same company that it used to be. Um, but does the Securities and Exchange Commission have anything to say about things like this? No, they don't. There's no law, there's no regulations against any of this, which is part of the problem. I would invite, you know, the SEC and our elected leaders to think real hard about how they put those guardrails in. I used that phrase earlier. Capitalism works when there's guardrails in place. Capitalism works when we understand as a society that it's got to work for everyone. It's just not doing that right now. It's working for men like Randall Stevenson, who can go empire building mode, go full neutron jack mode, jack up the stock price for a couple quarters, take his thirty million, I gotta believe he was paid something more than that and probably closer to three hundred million dollars at the end of the day. Go look at the collective compensation he drew over his time as CEO. And he retires into the sunset, leaves everyone else holding the bag, those men and women working to call centers, stringing the lines. What are their lives like? Compare and contrast the life of an AT&T frontline worker with the life of Randall Stevenson. And that, to me, is the problem with our economy today. What's next? And it goes right back to Jack Welch. What's next for Dave Gellis? Well, I'm, again, really delighted to be a reporter at the New York Times. I've got a new focus here. I'm still writing about business, but doing it through the lens of climate change, trying to understand how business can be a part of the so fight against dangerous planet warming emissions and understanding exactly, you know, what it is, where they can help and where they're hurting, where they're still holding people back. Um, so that's what I'm up to these days, in addition to uh, spending time with people like you who have been such a great interviewer and asked me so much, so many smart and uh, fun questions about this book. The book is called The Man Who Broke G- Capitalism. Subtitled is How Jack Welch Gutted the Heartland and Crushed the Soul of Corporate America and How to Undo His Legacy. Uh, Dave Gallus of the New York Times, our guest. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.